In the spirit of reflection, today's IP is going to allow us to critically think of what it means to serve in our profession of arms, to answer that higher calling, and also to focus on the vital virtue of trust. Today's speaker epitomizes all aspects of what you're going to hear about today, of what it means to not only serve in a profession, but also to serve as a professional. Colonel Bottomley is a lifelong learner, graduated from the Air Force Academy, multiple master's degrees along the way, uh, culminating recently with a doctorate degree in leadership. And it's from Auburn University, so that gives him a special plus. Uh, War Eagle. Yeah, War Eagle indeed. Um, but that's pretty incredible when you think about it. Today you're going to have a, a speaker who uh, has served uh, almost three decades in the profession of arms and uh, possesses one of those rare talents of a, uh, of a doctorate degree in the very fundamental thing that you're spending this entire course learning about, which is strategic leadership. Along those lines also, though, he is both tactically and technically proficient with over 2,500 hours in the cockpit of an F-16, 250 of those hours while serving in combat during his multiple deployments. So basically what we have today is a, is a real treat for the student body. We have a warrior, we have a scholar, we have a mentor, and a personal friend. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, allow me and to introduce and uh, warm welcome as he's jumping out of his seat to uh, Colonel Bottomley, your assistant dean. Hoorah. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. I guess uh, we've got seminar two in the house and seminar 12 uh, today. So welcome to you all and welcome to everybody that's uh, watching via YouTube. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to be here and talk to you about stewardship, but mostly the profession of arms is what we're here to talk about. My question for today is, will you steward the profession of arms? You're no longer a participant. You are now transitioning to being a steward of the profession of arms. The next question that I have for you this morning, so the second question is, why are you here? Why are you here? Why are you at the War College? Why are you still wearing the uniform or still serving in your organization? Have you thought about that? Is it just a gig? Is it just something where you're waiting till the next better thing comes along? Is it the best job you thought you could get right now? I don't think it probably is because I think you probably made that decision a long time ago that this was the organization that you wanted to serve with. You recognized that you had a calling. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I have to start off with a... Uh, the, the, the disclaimer down at the bottom, a debt of gratitude to Dr. Don Snyder, my mentor. Uh, he was the mentor for my SRP, which is my PSP, when I was at the Army War College when I first met him. I'll show a video of him here in a minute. Uh, that, I would say that that process of writing the strategic research paper, again, your PSP, I wrote mine about moral courage, I would say it changed my life because I don't think I would be on stage if I hadn't spent that six months really diving into that subject and trying to understand it. So I would encourage you, the PSP is not about getting a master's degree. It's not about you turning in a 20 page paper. It's about you growing professionally. Pick a topic that's gonna grow you and then uh, spend some time with it. Now what you can't do is what I'm doing right now is saying at the very beginning that I'm going to steal all kinds of information from Dr. Snyder today. So don't do that in your paper and then steal information from other people, but I am stealing from him. I am standing on his shoulders uh, he, he's a giant in this field. He is really the dean of the profession of arms. So when I talk about professionals, or when we talk about the profession, professionals, a lot of people, what do you think of? You think of athletes usually, right? You think of high paid, uh, and incredible athletes. So I don't know, what, what team are you thinking of right now of high paid, uh, well coached? You know, these players get all kinds of money to do what they're doing. I would say University of Alabama probably, those players get all kinds of money to do what they're doing. That's a joke. Okay, so uh, instead we've got other athletes out like uh, at Auburn University who do it for the love of the game, I'm sure. And so, uh, so let's move on. So will you steward the profession? Why are you here? Uh, today we're gonna talk about the profession of arms. We'll talk about profession and professionals. We'll talk about profession versus bureaucracy. Uh, we'll talk about some trust, of course, and then uh, We'll also say, why do we care whether we're a profession or a bureaucracy? Is it just because we want to be proud and say we're a part of a profession? 
No, I think there's a lot more to it. We'll talk about the ethic of the profession, the ethos, and then we'll talk about you as an individual, as a professional, and how you are going to struggle with uh, situations, decisions, judgments in the future. Um, so first of all, let's go to Dr. Snyder. So this is the person you're missing out on seeing on the stage. Instead, you get to hear me. Uh, again, the Dean of the Profession of Arms. This is the way he started his lecture here at the War College for the last couple of years, talking about his experiences in an unprofessional military organization of Vietnam. How did I get involved in the study of this? Why was I interested? Actually, from a pretty early age in the question of whether the Army was a profession or not. One answer is that I served very early in the Army when I watched it and I participated in it utterly deprofessionalized itself. I had three combat tours in Vietnam. By the time I came out of the third combat tour, the Army was not a military profession or anything close to it. It was a lumbering, giant, defeated military bureaucracy and it behaved like one. On a personal level, on my first tour in combat, I was commissioned in 62, I got to Vietnam in 64, I was an XO of a Special Forces 8 attachment. We were training ethnic Chinese to become trail watchers up on the Laotian border. It was a mission that we were doing under SOG. It's now declassified so we can talk about it. It involved insertions at night in smoke jumpers equipment going into double canopy jungle. The intent was to land in the thickest canopy you could find and hang up your chute would hang up in the canopy, you would go through the first layer, do an Australian repel, 200 feet, a big gob of <laughs> nylon rope in your leg, and then repel down, hide your gear, and go do trail watching. The losses in the missions were so heavy that Sog stopped the mission after four months. The first time I jumped with him, I had an interesting experience. I was an advisor to the South Vietnamese Special Forces. And so as an advisor, many of you have been advisors, you understand there are some things you can do and some you can't. But in any case, my first jump, as we were getting ready to jump, it was night, we were sanitized, Taiwanese 46, plausible deniability of the whole mission if anything went wrong. And I noticed the jump master who was in Vietnamese Special Forces in the den of the little red light, that was all that was there. We were going to jump at 600 feet, no reserve, didn't have time for that. You took one oscillation and hopefully came back and hit the canopy vertical so that you could get through the canopy. And I noticed that he wasn't doing things the way American jump masters do them. Because he was doing his jump masters and the motions of the jump master in each set, he was doing one handed. And I said, well, I just trained with this guy. I know he's got two hands. And I finally kept looking, and in the kind of the dark and the din, and the Americans were at the end of the stick, and the Vietnamese were at the front, I finally could see that he'd reached in a shoulder holster and pulled out a 9 millimeter and cocked around in it. And that was in his right hand. While well, he was giving all the instructions with his left hand. Now, I was, what, at this point, six years off the farm in Ohio. I wasn't the smartest guy on the block, and I certainly wasn't the dumbest guy on the block. And I finally figured out rather quickly what he was going to do. If any of the Vietnamese in the front of the stick didn't go out the door, he was going to shoot them and push them out. And then I thought, I'm in the same stick. <laughs> We're the last two people in this stick. What's going to happen if it comes to me? And my answer was, he'll shoot me. And he would have. So I learned very quickly that the ethic of a military organization is not necessarily that of an ethic of a profession. That was an utterly autocratic, bureaucratic military. The ethic came out of the point of the gun. The ethic came out of the point of a gun. We'll talk in a few minutes about transactional, transformational leadership. Obviously, the point of a gun is a very transactional style of leadership. Talk about sticks and carrots. Uh, that is not the way to inspire troops to lead and to follow you and to combat, nor uh, to be experts in their field of study. And so let's go on and we'll talk about you being the stewards of the profession. Uh, one of your readings last night was from General Dempsey. So he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And in 2011, General Dempsey really focused on reinvigorating the profession of arms. Uh, 
not just in the Army, but that's where a lot of the work was. Dr. Snyder had been working on it uh, for about 20 years at that, uh, 20 years at that point. Uh, published several books with other, uh, other scholars around the country. And this is what General Dempsey said, is he said, we're not a profession just because we say we're a profession. This is probably something you've been told since you first joined a military organization, maybe ROTC or at, at an academy or some other type of uh, initial professional military education, that you were a professional. And so think about that. I remember when I was at the Air Force Academy, I was told I was a professional and I was joined in a profession of arms. And what that meant was that we stayed late to finish the work. We did whatever, it, so, so the concept is there. You do whatever it takes to finish the mission. But I remember from back then, you know, a snotty 18 year old thought I knew everything. And I remember if I go home at 3.30, then I'm not a professional. If I wait till 5.30, then I'm a professional. Okay, there's a lot more to being a professional than just what time you go home at night. Uh, so here's some examples of profession. So other professions besides the profession of arms, of course, we've got uh, the, the recognized, the well-recognized professions are the medical, of course, and legal. And those two and the profession of arms are generally the, the top three that people think of. There are other professions, accountancy. Now accountancy has possibly lost its profession or it's very anemic because of Enron. The legal profession, I would say, is anemic as well. Why? I'll say the name. Hi, I'm Andrew Shannara, and you call me, and I'll get you lots of money. When that is what people think of, of a profession, is you call me, and I'll get you lots of money, and oh, by the way, I'll, I'll line my pockets with lots of money too. That's not a profession. So we have to be careful in our professions inside the profession of arms because they can go away as well. Inside the profession of arms, so the large umbrella, we have probably several uh, five, six professions. We obviously have an aerospace profession that practices in the domain of air power. We have a land profession that specializes in land power, maritime and sea power. You can see we're aerospace. So we've got folks in the Navy that fly F-18s and, and other aircraft in the Navy. And I think they're probably members of dual professions there is because we trade expert knowledge. We share expert knowledge as Air Force pilots with Navy pilots and they do the same with us. The joint profession, so there's a joint profession, they specialize in intelligence and logistics are two areas, the fusion of intelligence, which you've heard of and you read in Stan McChrystal's book. Uh, space profession, is that a profession? Well, it's, it's getting to be a service, and if it's a service, because you call yourself a service, that means you must be a profession. Not necessarily, and I'm not saying space is not a profession, I think that's one of the reasons why they wanted to be separated from the Air Force, why? Because professions develop expert knowledge they infuse that expert knowledge into humans, i.e. expert practice, and then they have a culture of trust inside their organization and also with their client external. Space profession, I think it's developing right now because I think they're developing their own expert knowledge. So, stewarding the profession. General Dempsey also called us to steward the profession. He said that as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he was the steward of the profession, but I think we, as senior leaders, strategic leaders, strategic advisors are moving into that role to where we're not only members of the profession, we are stewards of the profession. What does a steward do? A steward res uh, exercises responsible care over something that doesn't belong to you. It's entrusted to you. As commanders, your previous job, uh, probably a lot of your previous jobs, is you were entrusted with resources and people. Uh, when we're re entrusted with uh, people, for example, it's our job to train them the best we can and when they leave the military, give them back to the citizenry a better person than they were before. And that's an example. But in this case, stewarding the profession means we take ownership of it and we foster it, we grow it. Again, coming out of uh, uh, General McChrystal's book, being a gardener, nurturing that profession, growing it. So three of the primary characteristics of a profession, I've already mentioned them, is that creation of expert knowledge. You have to create expert knowledge in the combat fields five to eight years before it's needed. Again, we'll talk in a minute, when you show up to combat and that expert knowledge is not there, it is very fatal. It's very self-critiquing. You can see it all over the battlefield. It has to be developed five to eight years prior to need because you have to do the second thing. You have to develop that military expertise inside humans. The profession is a human practice. 
We used technology as tools. I strapped on an F-16, but it was me, the professional inside the F-16, which was the lethal part of that weapon system. And it was it, you and whatever weapon system that you operated in or whatever logistic supplies that you delivered because as a professional, your job is making professional judgments, not decisions, otherwise you're a bureaucrat. If you're just making routine decisions, you're just a bureaucrat. Lastly, a profession will also maintain an ethos and that will guide uh, behaviors of the members of that profession. They'll, uh, the cultures of trust, internal and external, we've already talked about, there has to be that, have mission command inside the organization in order to have autonomy from external agencies. So your office, you've taken an oath of office, and you remember it mentions the duties of the office I'm, upon which I'm about to enter. What does that mean? Your office is you. It's not the place you go and sit during the day for a few minutes before you're walking around to see your troops. The office is you, and it's a moral office. Let's see what uh, the new chairman of the joint, I'm sorry, the new uh, chief of staff of the Air Force, as he was issued his oath of office. Listen to the words. Oath of office. General, place your left hand on the Bible, raise your right hand, and repeat after me. I, General Charles Q. Brown, Jr., do solemnly swear. I, General Charles Q. Brown, Jr., do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties of the office upon which I'm about to enter. The duties of the office upon which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. So the duties of the office upon which I'm about to enter, those duties of that office are a moral office. They're, what that third bullet says, they're the responsibility to exercise discretionary judgments on what you believe as a professional to be true, right, and just. There's no checklist for executing the duties of your office. You have checklists for how you uh, maybe uh, do some type of uh, the, the job or a task. But your job as a professional is to use discretionary judgment to do what is true, right, and just. I would argue that it's a moral office because, as we see in the bottom, a simple definition of moral office is that you're responsible for uh, making judgments that affect the well-being of other people, both the people that work for you, the people that work around you in other organizations, and also for the American people, the taxpayers, the money that they give you, your judgments will affect their well-being. Whether you waste money, you spend it wisely. So think about that as, again, everything that you do. And it's not, when we say moral, I'm not talking about just ethics. So character, competence, and commitment, we're not talking about just character. Every decision you make, your competence is a moral decision. If you drop a bomb on the wrong people because you were incompetent in the aircraft or in your weapon system and you kill other people, was that incompetence a, a breach in your moral office? Absolutely. So think about that. So what do professionals do? Uh, this is another uh, quote from one of your readings last night by uh, Admiral Klein and Colonel Basic. And so they talk about an expertise professionals provide in an area that's vital to society. We have that self-policing ethic called an ethos, and we are granted a high degree of autonomy, not complete autonomy. Of course, we know Congress oversees what we do, especially through budgetary means. And people identify as stewards of their profession. And so, as we look through these, uh, providing a vital service to society, a, a vital service that society can't provide for itself, but they have to have to flourish. Let's think back about our other professions, medical profession. Do the sick need a cure? Absolutely. Most sick people can't cure themselves, so they go see a professional, a doctor. Uh, the accused need justice, so they go see a lawyer, someone who's studied, trained in the years of training and that special expertise knowledge in order to help you. Do the insecure or do all people need security? Absolutely. So they come to you as the profession the professional in the profession of arms, and even specifically in your profession, aerospace and air power, 
They come to you looking for you to provide security for them, something that they can't provide for themselves. We work with abstract or expert knowledge. Not something, it is something that's written in books, but we write it there. We call it doctrine. Congress doesn't write it for you. Would you like Congress to write the expert knowledge by which you deal with and by which you execute your message? mission? Absolutely not. When Congress or the American people don't trust you, that's exactly what they do. They come into your organization and they take away some of your autonomy and they write your doctrine for you, i.e. they write rules for you. And that usually, almost always, inhibits your ability to execute the lethal mission by which you're charged. We have to, in order to maintain that autonomy, maintain trust with the American people and with the, the representatives in uh, the political offices that represent them. And so that ethos, that ethic, is what guides the trust. And it's a self-policing. It shouldn't be an external. Otherwise, again, we're looking at being bureaucrats, where we're looking for rules and regulations in order to guide our behavior. Finally, that, relative, that uh, granted uh, relative autonomy that we need, again, that is the, that's what we need in order to apply the art and science of your job. That autonomy really is the soul of our profession. And why is it a soul? Because if it's not there, our profession is dead. You have to have the autonomy. So let's look and let's compare professions versus bureaucracies. I've talked about bureaucracies in a bad way, a bad connotation to the way that I've mentioned bureaucracies. Bureaucracies are not bad. We need bureaucracies. In the military, we absolutely have bureaucracies. And bureaucracy is the direction that most military organizations or any large organization has a tendency to lean back on. What we as professionals have to push, we have to steward our organizations to be professional. Look at some of the comparisons. So again, uh, professions develop expertise knowledge. Bureaucracies apply generalized knowledge. Again, I won't read each one of these to you. That seeks lifelong learning. That's one of the reasons you're here. I will tell you again, when I was younger in my uh, career, I did not want to come to PME. I wanted to be out flying my jet because I thought of myself as a technician. That's all it was. I was there just to be a technician. But I, underst I now understand that sitting in these seats, being a lifelong learner of the profession, not just your technical expertise, is what we need in you, especially as stewards of the profession. We need you to understand that larger picture. Um, again, we, we make complex judgments. We don't just uh, do routine situations. If you find that you go to work every day, and you find that you're doing a job, the same job every day, you're making the same decisions, very predictable, you follow checklists in order to do it, you're operating as a bureaucrat. That doesn't mean that you're not a professional, but recage yourself. Check yourself and say, I need to step out. I'm probably not fulfilling my duty to the full call. I'm probably not fulfilling that moral office by which I've been charged if I'm just doing the same thing every day. So some of the other uh, items on this list, so I'll look at this. Uh, I can see this easier. Um, accepts prudent risk, prudent mitigated risk. Bureaucrats avoid risk. How many times do you see that? You see that quite a bit. Why does a bureaucrat avoid risk? Because they don't want to get in trouble. Or the checklist doesn't say what to do. It takes judgment. It takes discretionary judgment for you to accept risk. You have to understand the pros and cons. And there's risk to you as an individual when you take risks, not just expenditure of money or possibly getting in trouble. It could affect your career, which that takes us to another one, is that professionals aren't focused on their career. Professionals are focused on the effectiveness of the organization. Another aspect of being a profession or in a professional is moral courage. No bystanders are allowed in the profession of arms. When you find bystanders, you find bureaucrats, or you find people that are self-protected. You find people that are afraid to step up and say something because it might negatively impact my career or the way that people look at me. You remember what we talked about earlier is that your job is about finding and bringing forth justice? That's what moral courage is about, not being a bystander. Finally, a lifelong calling, the vocare. That's the Latin term. A lifelong calling, meaning that the job that you do what you're doing is more important than you are. Rather than, it's just a job, just a paycheck. This is just a gig that I'm doing until I find something better comes along. You could have gotten out of the military a long time ago, 
but I think you've probably discovered that this is your calling. This side of eternity, you, you need to have a calling in order to find life fulfilling. And so I would, I would offer that what inspires profession is understanding that this is a lifelong calling. Inside our profession, we have negotiated jurisdictions. What, what we call them in doctrine is missions. But the left side of this uh, slide shows you what our external jurisdictions are. We've negotiated these with the American people through their, uh, through their politicians and with the other professions that we operate in. And we say, these are the things that we will do. As aerospace professionals, these are the things that we will do. We'll provide your air superiority. We'll bring things to you through uh, rapid mobility and so forth and so on. The right side, and so these, the left side change with each profession. So these are our jurisdictions as airmen. Your jurisdictions, if you're in land power, are different. The right side, I would argue these internal jurisdictions probably apply to all professions. So we create expert knowledge. Again, when's the last time you did that? Again, if you haven't been doing that, check yourself. It's not just about technical expertise. It's not, as an F-16 pilot, how I'm going to execute F-16 tactics. It's about all of these fields. We create expertise, knowledge, technical, in your weapon system, but also moral and ethical. We create expertise, knowledge, in our political military relationships, the culture. And then lastly, in human and leader development. We take that expertise knowledge that's been created and then we embed it in humans. Develop future professionals with that expertise. When that vocare is a key aspect of being a steward leader. So this is a moral compass. I, I put professional compass on it for you. Where is your professional compass oriented? A steward leader, your professional compass comes out of you focused on the profession. Focused on the needs of others and the needs of the profession. And again, that vocari, it's more important than you are. It's more important than your next promotion is. It's more important than your next job is. It's more important than whether you have a window in your office. A egocentric leader's focus is, what about me? When am I gonna get what's coming to me? You know, uh, the Latin for I, me, is ego. You know, we all have to be, we all have to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. But how many times have you seen some these leaders? We, it's easy to point them out, right? Is that leader who everything is about them. You know, and that's especially, there's a, uh, there's a big caution to you as you go into those strategic levels of leadership. You have access to more resources. You'll read that in the Bathsheba Syndrome article. You have access to more resources. You're the one in the room that's right. And you have to be careful about everything becoming about you. What about me? Sorry, I, I really want to ask you this question on the bottom. It's easy to recognize this in other people. Oh, look at that guy. Look at this lady. But how do you recognize it when it's happening to you? Because it's a slow fade. That moral fading to egocentric leaders, leader behaviors about it being about me. You have to have some people around you, some checks, in order to make sure that it's not just, uh, it's not happening to you. So, that trust, let's transition to trust. Uh, trust simply is placing your faith and confidence in someone else or something else. Uh, trust is essential to the, uh, to the profession of arms. Again, it grants us autonomy. That autonomy grants us the ability to create experts' knowledge. That expert knowledge goes into humans. We execute the mission. You see the sequence there? Uh, the researchers talk about trust, uh, that, that it has a behavioral, a cognitive, an affect, an emotional aspect to trust. Uh, the trust is built with integrity, motives, competence, predictability. It's both external and internal. What do these lists on the bottom look like? They look a lot like core values. In the Air Force, they look a lot like our core values. Our core values are about building trust. Trust with other airmen, trust with American people. And trust with soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen. So what happens when trust is taken away? Because trust can be granted, but it can also be taken away. The profession uh, is extent, ex, existentially, ex, sorry, existentially, I can say that word, existentially degraded when your trust is taken away. When have you seen trust taken away in the military forces? 
When Dr. Snyder came back from Vietnam and folks were walking through the airport and they were being spit on, can you imagine that? We, we as professionals in the modern military, I don't think understand what that's like. It's for the American people to not trust you so bad that when they see you walking in your uniform, they spit on you. That would be a terrible thing is for you, especially if you're trying to live as a professional, a vocare, a calling that's more important than you are, and you're sacrificing yourself, but the people don't appreciate it. But the reason why that trust was taken away is because people weren't sacrificing beyond themselves. There was a several reasons. It wasn't because the people in the military at that time were being self-serving. The mission had gone wrong, the draft, all of it caused the American people to take their trust away. Core values helps keep that trust in check and in line. So you can see here that I'm comparing the Air Force core values, integrity, service, and excellence, with the three C's. This is something that, again, the Army worked on, that character, competence, and, uh, and commitment. Those, are, those three C's is what they, the Army talks about being essential to trust. This is not the Army's core values, so if you're, if you're a soldier in here, uh, I, I'm not meaning to say these are your core values, but they closely align with the Air Force's core values. We have to have integrity. We have to have commitment, that service to other airmen and to other uh, military members, but then also service to the nation, and then finally excellence. Excellence is your competence, and everything that you do, it's doing it to the best of your ability. So, one of the reasons why we have to do everything to the most excellent uh, level of our ability is because we are in the killing and dying business. On the left-hand side here, you can see an F-16 dropping an LGB on a group of insurgents. On the right-hand side, uh, a fighter is being shot down. So you have a unique calling in the profession of arms in that you are called to kill, and when you're not killing, you're called to prepare to kill. Think about your career. That is what we do every day, almost as much as we can in, in the uh, fighter community is we prepare to kill. And we called, on, uh, called upon justly to kill and to kill swiftly. But if you're going to be in the killing business, then you better be in the dying business. And I'll tell you this, the worse you are at the killing business, the better you're going to be at the dying business. You're going to get lots of practice seeing your fellow professionals die if you're not good at killing. That sounds morbid. But swiftly executing justice causes less death and less destruction. Why do we care? So, Rock, you've said we're professional. I've heard it since I was in ROTC. I've heard it since I went through OTS. I've heard it since I was at the academy. I'm a professional. Okay, got it. I'll wear a patch. I'll tell my friends I'm a professional. What does it matter? What it matters is military bureaucracies die in, in combat. Not the bureaucracy, but the people in the military bureaucracy die. It, they're big, lumbering organizations that get themselves killed, especially against an agile, formidable foe. When you see multiple bureaucracies going after it, military bureaucracies in war, you just see long, drawn-out wars where still lots of soldiers die. But when you see a military bureaucracy go against an agile foe, you see that agile foe picking them off, and they're dying. And the whole time that the, that the uh, military is dying, the civilians are also getting slaughtered. Possibly your civilians, if they, again, thinking as Americans, uh, I know we've got coalition partners, but when the war comes here, your civilian, civilians dying. But also, you have a moral responsibility to the civilians of that combatant nation, don't you? And the more swift that you are at that lethal force, the less those civilians will die. This quote by uh, Wick Murray is great because he talks about the Civil War is a 700,000 person monument to military amateurism. Line them up, shoot them down. Line up the military forces. Again, conscripts a lot of times. Line them up. Technology had evolved to the point where you shoot them down. We can't afford that. We don't want that. It's our moral responsibility as professionals to not allow that to happen. So that's the point, is when you see military bureaucratic behavior, especially as it creeps stronger and stronger into your organization, eliminate it. Push, it. push back on it. 
It needs to be there for certain things because bureaucracies, as we saw in the chart, are efficient with routine tasks. But routine tasks without expert knowledge being created and without it being infused in humans causes you to lose wars. And this is what General Odierno talked about. So you remember uh, the United States coalition went into Iraq, 2003, uh, blew through the Iraqi forces, got to Baghdad, and everything come to a halt. You might have even been there. Everything stopped. And look at what General Odierno said. Look at some of the words he uses. We were surprised by the changing tactics. We had no idea. We didn't recognize. It took us too long to adjust. That's, a, that's, a, that's an honest, it takes a lot of humility for him to admit that as a division commander. But what he was saying is that coming out, is that those forces that got there were not prepared. They didn't recognize the problem that they were going to face. They didn't even, once they recognized that there was an insurgency mixed with terrorism going on, they didn't have the playbook. They didn't have the expert, to or expert knowledge they could pull off the shelf and go, guys, you remember we did this training. Ladies, we've got to go out and we've got to execute what we trained with. It's not even in the playbook. So everything came to a halt. In war, can you call time out? Hold on just a second. Don't punch me in the nose again. There's no timeouts in war. This is what, this is what happens. This is what happens in, in combat when you're not prepared. Your soldiers die and the civilians cry when they're not dying. That is why we have to show up with that expertise knowledge embedded in humans. You're like, Rock, I've got it. I heard you say that. It's your job. You're the steward of the profession, and you've got to be the one responsible. Think about right now, what, war, what fight is waiting your profession? What fight is waiting the aerospace profession, the land profession, the maritime profession, the cyber profession, the space profession? What's waiting for you five to ten years from now? Is it great power competition? Is there somebody out there looming? Is there somebody sitting in another seat? Is there somebody out there that's developing tactics to kill American soldiers, airmen, sailors, Marines? Absolutely. And we've been charged by the stewards of our profession, which you and I are becoming. We've been charged by them. Over the last several years, they've put out several documents that said professional military education has grown stagnant. You are not ready for the next fight. Are we ready for that fight? Imagine right now, if, if there's a weapon, and the lights go out, and there is a weapon, imagine if your enemy right now, our enemy, and the lights go out, and there's just chaos. The American people are going to look at the military and go, did you know this was going to happen? Were you prepared for this? And when we sit there and go, I'm sorry, we were surprised by that. Well, we had no idea that was going to happen. We didn't recognize it, but, but give us just a second, we'll, we'll fix this. That is unacceptable, right? And so the charges for us as military professionals, think five to ten years from now, think deep, think hard. Maybe this is your PSP. Think deep and hard. What aspect of the fight, again, the stewards of the profession are telling us it's great power competition, do we need to be prepared for? You have to write about it now, which is part of developing expertise knowledge, so that then it can go through the bureaucracy, so that then we can start fielding it into forces and buying the equipment that those forces need. But mostly, it's the humans that need to be trained in it. The quintessential act of professional practice. Again, you've heard us, we've, we've talked about this a bit already, is we practice using expert knowledge. It's new tasks. It's not routine things. You do have to do routine things. I have to do routine, routine things in my job. You know. Uh, I don't need to go through the list of your job, but there are routine things that you need to do. There are bureaucratic things that need to happen. But you need to always be pushing back on those because those bureaucratic routine things, will they take over your schedule? Absolutely. Will they take over the schedule of all the folks that work for you? Absolutely. And you have to push back on those and say, we are going to be looking to the future. We're going to be looking towards that expertise, not just the routine things. Because... A, again, think about a medical doctor. You go to, uh, you go to see your medical doctor, uh, the third bullet down, they're going to they're gonna classify the uh, issue that you have. And if they see things as routine, hey, doctor, I've got this ache right here. 
okay, well, you don't need to tell me anything more. I know exactly what's going on with you. I've seen this so many times. I read about it. Uh, I learned it back when I was in med school 20 years ago, and I'm sure we've got some practices that we can, we'll, we'll fix you. Well, hold on just a second. You, you, one, the last time you read about this was 20 years ago, so you haven't developed yourself professionally? You're, you're still using 20-year-old medical practices? And, and you're not going to classify this as a special thing? I know it might be, look a lot like something else, but you might want to know my medical history. You might want to know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's what professionals do is we diagnose things. We use abstract knowledge as in uh, it's not necessarily written in books unless we wrote it there. And then we go out and execute. We make a decision and we execute. But the other thing that professionals do is they follow up. They follow up to find out how did that action take. They evaluate it for effectiveness because that's what we're judged by is effectiveness. Did you win the war? Did I receive healing? Was, I found, was justice served? I would like to be found not guilty. Hopefully I'm, I'm uh, due to be found not guilty. Um, that's all hypothetical uh, beside the point. Anyway, uh, so... Effectiveness, they judge it for effectiveness. And then professionals have the humility to change the practice, to change their behavior or to change the diagnosis and go, we're gonna try something new. Do you push back when somebody tells you, gives you honest feedback? Does your organization, is it a learning organization when someone gives you feedback? Okay, there's appropriate places for feedback. There absolutely is appropriate place for feedback. If one of you pop up right now and go, Rock, you're completely wrong. You need to do this, you need to do that. Is that appropriate feedback? Not in this situation. I'm more than welcome, more than welcoming of you to come and tell me afterwards, hey, this, that, or the other. But, but we should be open as professionals and our organizations should be open to that honest feedback because we will continue to exercise discretionary judgment and actions and we'll follow up uh, and all of those actions will have high moral content. Again, think about moral. Moral is behaviors, judgments that we make that affect other people. This is something that the Army developed. Again, Dr. Snyder led this uh, study. And they looked at, across the top row, they looked at the legal foundations and the moral foundations with the Army as a profession. So you've got the profession, and you have professionals that operate within the profession. And so they categorized, and they looked at legal things that drive on the left-hand corner, and then they looked at moral foundations that drive the profession. And they also categorized professional legal issues and moral for the individual. So those professional for the individual. And, and through this quad chart, you can see the legal foundations for the profession and the professional, and then also for the individual. What you come up with when you look at this quad chart and when you surmise it as a whole, is you come up with the motivations of the legal profession is obligation. It's very transactional. Obligation, I've got the gun, you get out the door of the jump aircraft. The moral foundation, and there's, and so as well, when we're in combat, you know there's always a lawyer somewhere around to tell you what is legal, right? And so you don't have to seek out the legal foundations normally. As a commander, they're going to be there. And, and yes, you should hear the legal foundations. But what should drive your behavior as a professional is what is right. What do I aspire to? What do my troops aspire to? Transitioning folks from transactional behavior to transformational behavior. Changing the heart and the body will follow. You have to, as a commander and as a steward of the profession, always be looking for opportunities to push transactional leadership over to transformational. I say always. There are places, and I, in my dissertation I wrote about, uh, and I thought it was going to be, oh, yeah, we've got to push to transformational. What I found was that organizations with new learners, again, if we look at the situational leadership model, there's a curve. When you look at that and you try to use transformational leadership on someone that's unskilled in their job, they don't understand, okay, now we're talking the younger airmen, the younger enlisted, and, and probably the younger officers. When you try to push them too quickly with transformational leadership instead of transactional, they need to learn the rules. They need to know what they're supposed to do. But the entire time you're teaching the rules, this is the way you'll do this, this is the way you'll do that, you need to be driving them towards aspiration. What we don't need is as they get to mid-level leadership for you to continue to drive just transactional, sticks and carrots. 
We don't need pilots who stay in the Air Force just because it's a good paycheck, do we? We don't need people in the medical profession to stay in the medical profession just because it's a good paycheck, because what happens when coronavirus comes? That paycheck may not be worth me coming to work. I might call in sick. When, when the Claxton goes off and it's time to go to war and I see my fellow airmen dying, if I'm doing it for just for a paycheck, uh, I, I might not be able to go to that deployment with you. I might have to stay here. I'm not flying this mission. That's why we have to p push people towards their lifelong calling, towards transformation of the heart. We say certain things and we do other things, don't we? You've seen that. You've heard these briefings before. You've heard us talk about the profession. We profess some things and we observe other things. We profess core values. We're going to live by the core values, but sometimes we'll really lean on the law, the regs, the rules, the policies. We push transformational leadership, but we see an awful lot of leaders that just like the, uh, the uh, transactional, the sticks and carrots. We like the carrots, don't necessarily like the sticks when they're used on us. As leaders, we like to use the sticks, don't like to give the carrots. Instead, let's drive towards transforming people's behaviors uh, through their heart. Um, we like to say that we're here for the needs of the Air Force and for the service, but we also have a lot of us that drive towards careerism. You know, what job do I need to be in next that's going to get me to that next level job? You know, and what, if I get this, uh, what, is that a, how am I going to step to that next stone? What about me? When am I getting my medal? You know, I'm PCS, and don't I get a medal for being here? Well, I saw this person uh, get a medal for something like that. Do I get a medal for that? Those type of behaviors. It's, it's about, again, what about me? So, again, this is easy. Where have you observed? So this is something to take back to your seminar. Where have you observed gaps in the professional ethic and the daily practice? And as a steward of the profession, what are you going to do about it? What are you doing about it? When you see these gaps, what do you do about them? James Rest, psychologist, talked about when you see, when you see a discretionary judgment, i.e. a moral judgment, first of all, this is the steps. It was a, four, a simple four steps uh, process that he said you go through. Is you have moral sensitivity, i.e. you recognize that there's a, you've got to recognize that there's a moral situation that needs a judgment first, that it's not just a routine. And then you have to make a judgment. You have to judge what is the right, again, judge, judgment, discretionary, right, just thing to do. And then you have to uh, follow through. You've got to have the moral uh, motivation, that, that internal struggle to follow through with it. And oftentimes, this is an iterative process. You, you know it. You felt it before, especially a moral judgment that's different, one that affects you personally, where it costs you. When there's a moral judgment costs you, the more often this happens. You go back and go, is there any other way? You know, the different ethical lenses. Could I look at this through a deontological lens? What about consequentialism? You know, what's, what's best for everybody, including me? Um, Values-based. Different lenses looking at, you're, diff you're looking at it different ways. And on paper, I don't really like moral dilemmas, you know, all the moral dilemmas we do, because on paper, they're easy. And, and we know from studies that on paper, most people, especially with the type of education that you have, can ace those tests. You know the right thing to do. Now, there are some moral dilemmas where it's just choosing the better right between several wrongs, okay? Those are, those are good moral dilemmas just to create discussions. But when there's an honest right and there's an honest wrong, most people can, can get it right. The problem is, is implementing that moral action is very difficult. You know it because you've probably been there before. You knew the right thing to do, and it was clear in your mind. You knew the right thing to do, not in your mind, but also in your heart. But there was a gap. There's a gap between knowing the right thing to do and actually taking the action. What I wrote about in my PSP at the Army War College was we have ethical enablers and stumbling blocks that each of us put in our lives that either make that gap more difficult to cross or motivate us to go ahead and do the right thing. This is it. It looks very soft. And so the, the struggle of moral motivation as a professional, first of all, you've got to recognize this is now taking us through 
James Rest in the upper right-hand corner, we're taking us through James Rest model. You've got to first of all recognize there's a moral decision that needs to be made. What I argue is that then you look at that and you go, okay, I know the right thing to do. Okay, I, I've been through this. I, I can understand there is a right thing to do. But what I argue is that you have a moral courage aspect to your character and you have a moral coward. That's very binary. And it may hurt your feelings. But you have it. And you know you do. It's that voice inside. One says, you need to do the right thing. And another voice says, but it's going to cost me an awful lot. I don't necessarily want to pay that price. And they struggle. And that struggle is based on the fulcrum, is your character. The things that other people can observe and maybe even not observe on how you make moral decisions is your character. The struggle continues. When moral courage wins, you perform the moral behavior, even if it costs you. When your coward wins, you perform an immoral behavior. And that immoral behavior may be apathy. It may be not doing anything at all. Maybe the immoral action that you took was being a bystander. This is where those ethical enablers and stumbling blocks come into play, is over your lifetime, every decision you make, I depicted them, again, sorry for the, uh, the childish model here, as plate weights. They're plate weights on this balance beam of the struggle, and as moral courage, I've got the weights on my side of the beam that I've put there year after year with every decision that I made. I put some names on these plate weights. Those are not all exclusive or all inclusive. There are multiple things that you do in your life. These are honesty, self-sacrifice, discipline, humility. Your coward in you lives off of pride, self-indulgence, greed, deceit. Put anything you want there uh, that causes you to make immoral behaviors or not to take moral behaviors. Once that decision is made, once the moral courage wins, this is again an iterative process, your character changes. And when your moral courage wins, your, char your character grows stronger. And what this depicts is that the next time, because it happens right after that, because all day long you are making um, discretionary judgments as a professional. And so your next decision that you need to make is coming right around the corner. And your character's changed, in this case, for the better. When your moral coward wins, it pushes it the other way. And so it becomes more and more difficult to make the right decisions. This tug of war is happening on a balance meme. I specifically didn't use a merry-go-round. You remember merry-go-rounds when you were little? There'd be certain people who'd just sit on the merry-go-round and you'd sit there and kick and kick and kick and you're working yourself to death while other people are just free riding. There's no free riders in the profession of arms. Everybody grabs a hold of a rope and pulls. Bureaucracy, if your organization is operating as a bureaucracy or if you are operating as a bureaucrat, then yeah, you're just sitting, letting other people do the work with the profession, making those tough calls. You've got to choose courageously to do the right. Do the harder right. There's no uh, bystanders. Again, when I use the word bystander, a lot of us will form that immediately to sexual assault, sexual harassment, because that's a term that has been associated with that. There's bystanders, again, with any moral decision that you make or don't make. Let's listen to what Ronald Reagan said. Okay, wonderful picture. Let's listen to what he said in 1993 to the class at the Citadel about the same um, aspect of every day, every choice, affects your character. ...that takes command in moments of crucial choices has already been determined. It has been determined by a thousand other choices made earlier in seemingly unimportant moments. It has been determined by all the little choices of years past, by all those times when the voice of conscience was at war with a voice of temptation, whispering the lie that it really doesn't matter. It has been determined by all the day-to-day -day decisions made when life seemed easy and crises seemed far away. The decisions that piece by piece, bit by bit, developed habits of discipline or of laziness, habits of self-sacrifice, or of self-indulgence, 
habits of duty and honor and integrity, or dishonor and shame. Because when life does get tough, and the crisis is undeniably at hand, when we must, in an instant, look inward for strength of character to see us through, we will find nothing inside ourselves that we have not already put there. Again, awesome quote. And again, this is about you. We're talking about you as a professional, but we're also talking about you as a steward of the profession. You know this is what you want in the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, civilians in your organization. You want everybody striving to make every decision they can today and tomorrow that empowers them and enables them to make the right decision when life gets tough and the crisis is undeniably at hand. And so, this is as an individual, but as an organization, you have to decide. And again, a quote from uh, one of your articles today, is it the, when we say behavior that's not right, is it the apples that are bad, the people, or is it the barrel that's bad? Okay, so the apples are having this struggle. It's the character approach. The barrel, we have exemplars, the context, environment, specific situation. I've highlighted exemplars because that's what you are. You should be the steward leaders that people in your organization are looking up to. And we know from sociological studies that is the most powerful uh, form of change is that exemplar. You can probably think of exemplars, hopefully good ones, that grew you into the professional that you are. And you probably can think of some, some exemplars that let you down and where you're like, you know what? I'm gonna learn from that person's behavior, the way they were acting egocentric, and I'm not gonna be like that. So be that, be the exemplar that you want. Uh, shine is somebody that tells us another way to affect that barrel, the culture that you live in, or all of these. What we pay attention to, what leaders, how they react to certain situations, how leaders allocate resources. You know, what do, what do the leaders put, not just money to, but their time, their attention. That deliberate role model, as we as stewards of the profession, people are watching you. And they're watching your behavior, and you're setting the tone for how the organization's going to behave. Are we gonna behave as bureaucrats? And are we gonna be risk averse? Are we gonna behave as, you know, I like this, uh, I'm very comfortable in this situation. And so yes, I know that global power competition's coming, but that's a lot of work to make changes to get ready for that. You know, I'm just not really sure that I, I wanna put that type of effort into that. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. I'm sure we'll be able to deal with it. I'm sure if there is any type of competition that leads into conflict, well, you know, we're, we're Americans, we'll step up. We'll, we'll develop the expert, expertise, we'll develop the expert knowledge immediately. And we'll embed it in people and we'll, we'll buy the machines and the equipment that we need immediately. That, that's not the behavior that experts uh, the professionals have. They're looking for, they're, they're role modeling the right behaviors. Also, what do you allocate rewards for? When's the last time you gave a medal or recognized somebody for good ethical behavior? When you reward someone for something, everybody else looks at that and says, that's important. That's important to my boss. That's important to this person that I consider an exemplar. Or do you only give rewards when somebody PCSs? Okay, so, so the boss is telling me, do your time, get your medal. That's not what we're looking for. Takeaways. We're at our last. Uh, we're at our last bit here. These are some of the takeaways. These are the takeaways that I have for you. Again, I hope that you have your own. I hope that you take this away to your seminar and you discuss it. The first one in red is military bureaucracies lose wars, and people die while that's happening. Don't allow your organization to be a military bureaucracy. Fight for the profession. Because professions, again, I'll go through the cycle. Professions develop expertise knowledge, new expertise knowledge. They embed that in humans. They work off of an ethos that creates trust inside the organization. That facilitates mission command. Mission command executes the mission quite well because you have a lot of individuals, a lot of individual leaders going out and executing the mission rather than being risk averse waiting to hear from command headquarters going, what should I do? I'm encountering something new, what should I do? I trust you. That trust also leads to the American people or your citizenry of your country 
granting you autonomy. And that autonomy then allows you to develop the expertise that you need. And the cycle continues. Uh, and again, you can read the rest of these. Uh, stewards are not bystanders. Stewards are actively engaged in the social imperative and the military imperative, that character, competence, and commitment of their organization. And then the last thing that I want you to take away, and again, I've emphasized it, is what fight's waiting for you five years from now. The, st the stewards of our military profession of arms have called us to think about it. They haven't told us, they said it's great power competition, but they don't know how to deal with it quite yet. They're asking us to do it. They're asking you to do it. Find out what we need, develop that expertise, and go embed it in humans. So uh, the way you live your life every day is the way you're going to live your life that one day. That one day when the crisis comes, you can only fall back on what you've already put there. I come back to my initial question is, why are you here? Is it because you were told you had to come here so that you could get that next promotion? You can't be an, a general if you don't come here. Again, I won't tell you what type of behavior that is, but it sounds an awful lot like a bureaucrat. You got to check that box. I didn't want to come to school because I wasn't acting like a professional. But while you're here, take this today and go, you know what? I want to develop myself because a professional develops themselves. Think of a doctor and you go sit down with the doctor and that doctor says, yeah, I don't study those journals. I don't read those things. I'll just do what I, you know, what this book, this, this old book says that I should do. You don't want a doctor like that. You want a doctor that's on the leading edge of technology, the leading edge of medicine to fix you. The American people want you as military stewards on the leading edge of technology, the leading edge of developing humans so that you can do your job the most effectively. And then, so that's my last question, is will you be a steward of our profession? I also highlighted the quote that I started out with, uh, the, the Isaac, Sir Isaac Newton quote, is that I said that I was uh, seen further today because I was standing on the shoulders of a giant called Dr. Don Snyder. We are all standing on the shoulders of giants that have led us up to this point in the profession. And so, so now the job is for you to take on the onus of that profession. So that's what I have for you today. Uh, my charges, go back to the seminar, talk about it. And then after the seminar, take it home and think about it. When you're out for your run, think about it and go, will I take this on? And how do I do that? So I'm open for your questions now. We've got people in the room here. I think we've got Colonel Ritchie over here watching the Teams. If you're on Teams, I would encourage you, if you want to ask a question, ask it now because it shows up sometimes delayed here. And so I'm open to the floor.